Okay, so I, I think we're good to get started. I would like to welcome everyone to our Advances in Dementia Research webinar. This has been the fifth one, I believe. And this is a partnership between the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance in, as well as the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. And this series discusses research, recent updates in dementia research and then highlights dementia research studies that are occurring across Toronto. And today we're very blessed to have our speaker, Mark Poulos, and he will be talking about the links between sleep, cognitive impairment, and stroke. So a little bit um, about us, the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. We are one of 30 plus local ch chapters, and our mandate is to provide education, information, support to people who are living with dementia, care partners, family members and friends, healthcare professionals, as well as general public. So I've listed some of our, our contact information. We also do have an education platform, www.alseducate.ca, where you can do a lot of self-paced learning as well as webinars. And if you're interested about the variety of events that we do have, you can check out our event calendar. Some things that you may not know is that even though we are called the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, we service all dementias, not just Alzheimer's disease, and we don't require a diagnosis in order to access support and services. So that's something that I wanted to share. I want to also tell you a little bit about the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance, the TDRA. So established in 2012, the TDRA is a co collaboration amongst the University of Toronto and affiliated academic hospitals, including Baycrest, the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, Ontario Shore Center for Mental Health Sciences, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, Unity Health, and the University Health Network. The TDRA is working together to better understand, prevent, and treat dementia by creating a stronger link between basic science and clinical research embedding research into care, improving outreach and education to the community, and increasing the efficiency of collaborative research processes across the city. I do wanna let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and it will be shared a lot in terms of a few places. It will be on the AST YouTube channel, as well as on the TDN for your future reference. So now I'd like to hand it off to Natalie to speak to us a little bit about the partnership and our speaker. Thanks, Julie. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Dren. I'm a research coordinator at TDRA. Um, so TDRA and AST have partnered to try to make research more accessible to everyone, dementia research specifically. So the Toronto Dementia Network, or TDN, is a website that lists dementia-related programs and services across Toronto. On this website, we've created a new section called Research Studies, which lists dementia studies that are open for participation across the city. Each study that's listed is led by TDRA affiliated scientists and um, has been approved by a research ethics board. So there are studies for people with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, mild cognitive impairment, those who may be at risk for developing dementia, as well as healthy volunteers and caregivers. So the studies are all summarized in plain language. And to get started, the website link is shown here in orange. Information about the TDN can also be found on both the AST and TDRA websites. We can move to the next slide. Perfect, so on the website, there are two main pathways. Um, first, you can browse for a study using search terms, filters, and quick searches. When you find a study that you're interested in, you can fill out the contact form and you'll be connected to the research team who will enroll you in the study if it's something you're eligible for. Or at the bottom here, if you're not sure where to start, you can fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study and any information you enter on the website will be securely stored and protected. Next slide. Great, and this is what the website looks like. If you just search Toronto Dementia Network and not for research studies specifically, you can get to that section by clicking the tab along the top right, which we've circled here in red. When you're on the page, if you're looking for something specific, so for example, Alzheimer's disease, or you know the name of the study you're looking for, you can type it in the search bar along the top. 
you can either hit submit with that term or apply more filters like the type of study, age group, target population, or the study location, and then hit submit. Alternatively, you can use the quick search buttons we have in the blue boxes. If you'd rather fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study, click the match me to a study quick search box, or you can scroll to the bottom of the page and you'll see this orange button that says can't find a study you're interested in, and that will also take you to the questionnaire. Each study summary, as shown in the Enchance study example on the left, describes what the study is about, who can participate, the location, and the time requirement. And that's all in plain language again. Enchant is the study that will be discussed today, so you can check out the listing after the talk if you're interested in participating or maybe learning more. Next slide. Great, and now I'd like to introduce our speaker. And before I do, just a reminder to keep any questions till the end of the webinar for the Q&A period we have set aside. So we're grateful to be joined today by Dr. Mark Bulos. Dr. Bulos is a staff neurologist, associate professor of medicine and clinician investigator in the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Dr. Bulos's area of academic interest is the association of sleep disorders with transient ischemic attack, stroke, dementia, and other neurological disorders. He has an interest in home sleep monitoring, as well as the automated detection of sleep disorders. He has also explored novel treatment interventions for managing sleep disorders. So welcome, Dr. Bulos. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you for the very kind invitation, and uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? And can you hear me all right as well? Terrific, awesome. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll start here. We'll chat a little bit and then we'll have, uh, we'll open the last maybe 10, 15 minutes or so for, uh, for questions, okay? Um, so I have some funding disclosures based on uh, agencies that have kindly funded and supported my work. And also, um, I also have received or been uh, paid consultancy fees for different the companies as well. Some of them are listed here. Um, so what I hope to do is to talk about home-based approaches to detecting sleep. As many of you will know, uh, when you go to a sleep laboratory, it may be actually very difficult either for you or for your loved one. I like to talk, talk about the association of sleep apnea with cognitive impairment and stroke. And also talk about why there will be benefit to treating sleep problems, particularly sleep apnea, in people with cognitive impairment and stroke. And then to examine finally, if we have time at the end, the role that good sleep may play in clearing out harmful toxins out of the brain. So here, here's an outline, just outlining basically exactly those objectives that I mentioned. Ever wonder when you go to the sleep lab and you're wired up with a gazillion wires? Well, if you actually go to this website, you know, ever wonder what would your normal sleep look like? What should a normal adult with your age and your sex B. If you go to this website here, psgnorms.com, we actually created this little calculator that, um, that you could type in your age and your sex and you hit uh, submit and it will tell you what your normal sleep study results should be, okay? This is what your normal sleep study results should be in a sleep laboratory. It's not necessarily not necessarily what it'd be like at home. Okay, this is for a sleep laboratory sort of setting. Just want to throw that in there because it was several years worth of work, <laughs> but published in a nice journal. Let's first talk about detecting, like home-based approach of detecting sleep. So, you know, whenever you go to your doctor, they order a bunch of different tests based on what, you know, what the problem is. And most of the time, in the sleep world, we're mostly interested in knowing, do you stop breathing in your sleep? Are you stopping breathing in your sleep? And that's what we call sleep apnea. And we could use a home-based sleep test for that, all right? For abnormal sleep architecture, meaning is your sleep chopped up? Is it taking you a long time to fall into sleep? We can use something like a wrist actigraph. And that's sort of a fancy way of just saying something like a Fitbit, like what I'm wearing over here, okay? But basically, Heuristic tigraphy is just a fancy way of saying, you know, it's, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's like sort of like a Fitbit or, or these different smartwatches. 
So let's talk first about detecting sleep apnea at home. These are a whole bunch of different options that we could use, either in a research setting or even at home. And we have a lot of research studies going on that may employ these. But why would you bother use a home-based test? Why don't we just go to the sleep laboratory? Well, we know that if you go to the sleep laboratory, it's also what we call polysomnography. You're not gonna be consuming alcohol. You're not gonna be using your recreational drug that you may be using. You're not gonna be sleeping in your usual position. Your sleep quality will not be very, very good. And you're probably gonna be sleeping less, right? Compared to a home test, imagine if you do your sleep test at home, you'll be consuming the usual alcohol. You'll be consuming anything else you might be using. You'll sleep in your usual position and your sleep undoubtedly will be of better quality and probably of longer duration. So the question is, is really when we test patients for sleep, should we be using lab-based studies or should we be using home-based studies? And I would argue for that many people, perhaps using a home-based study would be a lot better, okay? For all the reasons that I listed here, especially it's more convenient and it reflects more of your actual, what, you know, it's, it reflects your home environment, which is more indicative of really how you sleep every night. There's a research that showed that these home-based tests are actually pretty accurate. We call these home-based tests level three portable sleep tests or level three home sleep apnea tests. There's a whole bunch of different terms, but the bottom line, but the bottom line though is that they, um, the bottom line though is that they, um, is that they're pretty accurate. And they're also cheaper too. Here are the cost of the devices. Whereas if you did, you know, the, when you go to the laboratory in the hospital, you, you find that they're very, very expensive. They're probably even more expensive than that. And now that COVID's taken place and, you know, Russia's invading Ukraine and all that kind of stuff, prices have all gone up everywhere. If you noticed everything, even when you buy your own food, everything's gone up. Never mind the medical devices that we may have to buy. They would also be pretty expensive. So the bottom line is that if we can test people at home and avoid the laboratory setting, we can actually save a lot of money. So in summary, the home-based tests are accurate. They're convenient for patients. They reflect a natural environment or a normal environment for your sleep, and they're associated with cost savings. The question we had is, can we actually use these in patients who have different neurological problems? So one of my... Uh, one of one, some of my lines of work have been to test these devices in stroke and also in patients with cognitive impairment. So we had a paper that came out looking at use of stroke and David Colelli, who is a former master's student and now a medical student, uh, now a medical student actually used these for patients in, with cognitive impairment and dementia and actually showed that people with cognitive impairment can use these devices quite successfully and found we've, in fact, we found that you know, 80 to 90% of patients who use these with cognitive impairments and dementia, they were actually able to successfully get a, a, a clear result after using a home-based test. One question though, is that if we use these home-based tests, can we help make people better? Can we help make people better? So we tested that first in stroke and I'll show you the stroke results first, and then I'll show you the results for the people with cognitive impairments. So one study here is we took people who had had a stroke and randomized them to a home-based test versus an in-lab test. And randomized means that if you join the study, you had a 50-50 chance of either getting the home-based test or getting the, the lab-based test, like the in-hospital or the in-laboratory-based test. 50-50 chance. And if you... Um, Sorry, just someone's asking, will we have time at the end to ask questions and answer? Yes, we will. So no problem. Thanks. Um, basically, if you're in the research study, half the people, half the people would, you know, again, half the people would have the whole base test or half the people would have the in-lab test. And if the in-lab, and if, and if sleep apnea was detected, we would treat them right away using CPAP, which is that mask you wear over your nose and over your mouth. We'll talk about that more a little bit more. Uh, and we found in our stroke patients that we were able to diagnose more people with sleep apnea because more people were using the sleep testing. We we're able to treat more people. We we're able to reduce people's daytime sleepiness. And we also improved 
there we also improve their uh, their ability to perform daily activities and we also found that it was a cost saving approach so the question is of course that all you guys are asking okay it works really well in stroke patients but thank god me or my loved one doesn't have stroke we actually have my my um my loved one has cognitive impairment they're dealing with dementia or something like that and so david savvy who's also a, he just graduated actually a couple of weeks ago from his master's after working my lab uh, so david savvy and i we we ran another trial but this time looking at patients who had cognitive impairments okay and we basically our question was is that if you take people with cognitive impairment rather than stroke patients now let's take people with cognitive impairments can you does does the use of home sleep testing versus in lab sleep testing increase you know does it improve outcomes that it increase the number of people who complete sleep testing and the bottom the bottom line is that here we've randomized to date 122 people it's the same same study design that if you joined this study you'd have a 50% chance of getting the home test versus a 50% chance of getting the in lab test if we found that you had sleep apnea, someone in the study was found to have sleep apnea, they would be treated right away. And then we would complete our outcome assessments at six months, just like other research studies. And so far we've screened 286 people, 179 were eligible, 57 people declined. And again, as I mentioned, we've randomized 122 patients. Our results are still pending, okay? But basically we randomized 61 and 61 to either a home test or to an in-lab test, and we found that they, um, and we found, as you can look over here at our numbers here, we found so far that the home-based test is looking, at least with our preliminary numbers here, to be, um, to, to be having uh, a much, much higher ability to be able to capture sleep apnea and to also treat people with first sleep apnea. So we're hoping, we're hoping that a home-based approach to detecting sleep problems will actually improve, uh, will improve outcomes. So again, a home-based approach has the potential to improve cognition, functional status, and quality of life, and also may enhance patient satisfaction. It may also save money for the healthcare system and for patients and loved ones. You don't have to travel to a sleep laboratory. It's a lot easier to do everything just at home. So um, let's talk now about sleep apnea and cognitive impairment, and could potentially could there be um, could there be, um, you know, and, and what the relationship is? Okay? So this is a slide from Savvy. But sleep apnea is when you stop breathing in your sleep multiple times. And sleep apnea, in its own right, it's a, it's a risk factor for developing cognitive impairment and dementia. Why is that? Is because at night people are spending more time with the oxygen levels low in their brain. Um, their sleep is more fragmented, and they're more sleepy. So so what basically one of the big challenges here is that can you, you know, when, if you have sleep apnea, you have a higher risk down the line of, of having, of, of getting dementia. And if you have dementia already or have cognitive impairment already, that can worsen over time with untreated sleep apnea. Same thing with stroke. It's not known to a lot of people, but in fact, if one has sleep apnea, it's a major risk factor. So a, a paper actually published out of Harvard, uh, followed 1,000 people from the sleep lab. And they controlled for a whole bunch of different fa risk factors. Basically with statistics, you can control for lots of different risk factors like age, sex, race, other risk, uh, uh, other vascular, um, other, other, other things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on and so forth. And they showed that even after you control for all those other things, even after you control for all those other things, you still sleep apnea by itself someone having sleep apnea still increased the risk of having a stroke after several years of observation. Sleep apnea is also linked up with things like high blood pressure, heart attacks, irregular heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation that give rise to stroke. So there's a very, very, very close relationship between having sleep apnea and things like stroke and cognitive impairment and dementia. So it's very, very, very important. Um, so the question you might ask then is, if they're so closely linked, if they're so closely linked, well, do you think that treating them will be beneficial? So this is what I want to talk about next, okay? 
So one of the challenges, I don't know if anybody's tried CPAP before, but it's a challenge to get it on your face, to keep it on your face. And from as a sleep specialist, uh, you know, this is one of the really big challenging things of the job is to help and guide people to use CPAP. And again, CPAP is a mask that you wear over your nose or over your nose and mouth. And it blows air and it keeps the airway open at night. But you can imagine, of course, having a mask on your face all night long may not be the best, you know, may not be the easiest thing to sleep with, right? You need to titrate it, you need to fit it, and it needs to be managed closely. And it can be initially uncomfortable, and there can be a lot of challenges with regards to nasal congestion and irritation, okay? So you can have, you really need to stick with it. That's why I really encourage all my patients. I really encourage my patients to really, really stick with it, but it's tough. I know it's really, really tough. And my heart goes out to, to patients who are asked to use CPAP because although it's a great therapy, it's, um, it's, um, it, it's sometimes hard to, to start off with. Of course, you can have happy outcomes and you can find a good mask and you can find a good fit for it. Savvy's research work involved the CPAP change cognition in cognitively impaired patients. So this was Savvy, Savvy uh, and I, we, took a, we basically took all the previous research participants I had recruited over several years, and we took all the people who were using CPAP for more than four hours per night and compared them to everyone who was using CPAP for less than four hours per night, as well as people who just didn't use CPAP altogether. And we compared, basically, we compared people who were sticking with CPAP for more than four hours per night and compared it to people who were not using CPAP for that much, okay, or not using it altogether. Here's our, again, preliminary stats here. 158 people were recruited, and these are the tests that they completed. And the bottom line that we showed here is that if you use your CPAP for more hours per night, you can have a positive change on your cognitive testing, okay? And a positive meaning that you can improve on your cognitive testing. The MOCA here is, stands for the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. That's one of the tests that when you go to your doctor and they measure your cognition, that's one of the tests they'll use on people with cognitive impairment basically every time you come and visit them. Okay? And again, just to put it straightforward, is that if you use your CPAP more, then there are more positive changes in your, in your cognition. Um, between different study visits. So this is actually very, very exciting because we know that there's lots of medications that can be used to kind of improve cognition, but also CPAP here is potentially a new therapeutic area as well. Um, so in summary, basically with the fully adjusted, which is like the most robust statistics, we found that you can improve your MOCA score. The MOCA is this cognitive test uh, with good CPAP adherence. Um, and, uh, and that, that's actually very, 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 very encouraging results. Of course, larger studies are needed. Our work was limited that it, we looked back, we did basically what we call a retrospective study. We looked back at patients and looked at their data. However, it would be better to do other study designs like a randomized trial and so on and so forth to see if, these, if, these, um, if this improves things. Okay. Likewise, in patients with stroke, if, if you or your loved ones had a stroke, it's also important to know that people who use CPAP actually do much better. They can improve their, uh, people, people who've had a stroke when they use their CPAP, they also do much, more, much better. They can reduce their blood pressure, they can reduce the risk of vascular events, and uh, five year, and they can actually re reduce the mortality. That's again in observational studies. Randomized trials, and uh, Lavenia and I looked at the literature Lavenia is a very talented uh, resident. She was a medical student when she wrote the paper with me a couple of years ago. Um, but the bottom line is we looked at every single trial. This is a busy slide. We looked at every single, we looked at every single trial in the literature that every single randomized trial in the literature that um, that compared people who use CPAP and people who didn't use CPAP after a stroke. And we found that people improved in so many different good ways. People who had less depression, they had better functional outcomes, uh, they had improved quality of life. So lots and lots and lots of, lots of good outcomes for using CPAP after a stroke as well. The trouble though, is that we didn't see any difference in death 
or the risk of future stroke. So that's what we call vascular outcomes. We didn't see any difference in, in, in the number of strokes people had in the future or the number of but the number or the number of people who died afterwards. Okay. Obviously, everyone will unfortunately go eventually, but I'm talking about any sort of premature death in this in the study time. But the trouble with this, I just want everyone to be aware of the trouble with looking at the current literature is that we've tested very, very, very small numbers of patients. If you look at all the previous studies, they tested very, very, very few patients. And re usually research studies involve thousands of patients, not like 60, 60, 55. These are small numbers of patients. They use their CPAP pretty late. And the overall adherence to CPAP was not very good. So you might remember from Savvy's work that in fact, you need about four hours of, of CPAP use to improve outcomes. But in, um, but, in, um, but, but, but in these other trials, people were using it very, very little, certainly less than four hours almost across the board, okay? Other things is other study designs that excluded patients who may actually benefit from CPAP. So maybe in the future, we'll have research that can show actually that CPAP can reduce strokes in the future and, and, you know, and, 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 and enhance longevity, but that we have to have different trial designs. We have to have different study designs to improve that, okay? And ideally we want, we might need to actually use, we might need to use different approaches, not just the use of CPAP, okay? So right now, when you go to your doctor, if you have sleep apnea, they'll tell you stuff about, losing weights, stop, you know, don't use sleeping pills, don't use opioids, like don't use those strong painkillers, don't sleep on your back, maybe they'll prescribe you a dental appliance, which unfortunately could be really, really expensive. CPAP, of course, and sometimes in rare cases, in rare cases, surgery. But there are, I just want everyone to be aware that there are some new things coming out. Unfortunately, they're not available in Canada yet, okay? But there are some new things coming out that may be of benefit to, um, to the, um, to patients who have sleep apnea and having a hard time, uh, uh, you know, having a hard time using CPAP. So there are some medications coming out. One was recently approved by the FDA. And there is this thing also called hypoglossal nerve stimulation, which is also known as the Excite device. And basically, if you're willing to have a piece of metal implanted in your tongue, they can actually vibrate your tongue and that can help improve outcomes as well. So, um, the last thing I just want to close off with is, you know, as we sleep at night, I think you guys are aware that toxins build up in our brain. Toxins actually build up in our brain. And having poor quality sleep is linked with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, poor cognitive performance, and strokes as well. Uh, atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis, the plaque buildup. And subcortical strokes are just a different form of, uh, subcortical infarcts are a different form of strokes. So we can measure your sleep quality using actigraphy. Again, something similar to your Fitbit device, which are these, you know, um, they basically can monitor movements both during sleep and during wake. And they take raw activity scores and convert them into sleep-wake scores. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different devices available on the market and they, they're pretty cheap, right? You can get a Fitbit. I got my Fitbit for about a hundred bucks, not a bad deal. Uh, and, um, and you, but you know, they can go really, really expensive if you buy more expensive medical grade ones. This is what it looks like. So when you, when you get a readout from these devices, you can see, you can kind of see, um, you know, the blue is where the person was sleeping and the yellow and black is where, is where the person was awake and black would indicate more activity. But of course, every device will have a different output screen. So, uh, 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 put, have a different output scheme. Sleep plays a really important role in clearing your brain's toxins. All right. So there are neuro, neuro, what we call these neuro, neurotoxic metabolites like beta amyloid. And you've probably heard about it before, beta amyloid, tau, all of these things. But it's thought that in the brain, you clear out these harmful toxins. You clear out the harmful toxins during sleep, especially during slow sleep. So in fact, if you look at the mouse brain, you can see specifically how the toxins are uh, clearing out in the mouse brain. We asked ourselves, do toxins get cleared out of the brain in humans as well? Is it just in the mouse or is this also occurring in humans? How can we measure toxins in the brain? Well, of course, you can't measure toxins in someone's brain, right? It's impossible. 
we'd have to do brain surgery and pull out their, you know, and do a biopsy, God forbid, or some more of that. But there is one thing that we, we do know, and that on MRI, you can actually see toxin buildup. People who have, people, every one of us have these little vertical robin spaces in our brain, but they get bigger. They get bigger as you get older and in people with, and with people with cognitive impairment and dementia. So the enlargement of these vertical robin spaces is thought to reflect toxin buildup in the brain. So what we did in our research study is, and this was done with Dr. Black, who some of you might know is a, a dementia specialist in Sunnyberg, actually a pretty famous one. And what we did is we took MRI pictures of people's brains and we compared how big are the vertical robin spaces to their sleep study numbers. And as I, just as a reminder, if you have bigger vertical robin spaces, that implies or that, that suggests that it suggests the buildup of toxins, okay? So basically we asked ourselves, are big perivascular spaces or vertical robin spaces correlated with measures of poor sleep in people who came to our sleep and stroke clinic? And of course, I wouldn't present you, I would not be presenting you these results unless the answer was yes. <laughs> we basically found in this paper published in a, one of the sleep journals is that if you had big vertical robin spaces, i.e. you had toxin buildup in your brain, that was very strongly correlated with uh, poor sleep quality and less of slow wave sleep, which is where it's thought that, that uh, the toxins are cleared out. So what, um, you know, a lot of people ask, how long should I be sleeping? Well, normally, normal I'll be, normally we recommend somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep every night. But if you don't get enough sleep, sleeping less than six to seven hours per night is associated with a whole bunch of bad things like heart disease and stroke, early risk of death, diabetes, weight gain, depression, immune impaired function. And as I mentioned before, of course, also cognitive impairment and dementia. But if you sleep for more than eight, eight to nine hours per night, also, it's also bad too. It's also linked with heart disease and stroke. Okay. And that's, that, there's probably a different number of reasons for that, but basically sleeping too much or too little isn't good for you. You should be sleeping somewhere between seven to nine hours, generally speaking. Okay. Maybe the people who are sleeping for a longer time, maybe they're in pain. Maybe they have other things. Maybe they're, they have depression, which can be really unfortunate, of course. Um, and maybe that's the reason why they're spending more time in bed. Okay. But, but regardless, um, regardless, sleeping too much or too little is, is not good for you. What are so, I want to just close with some general tips for good sleep. This is what I show all my patients who come and see me in the clinic. Now, you try to exercise as much as you can, but ideally you exercise in the morning. Um, you know, most guidelines suggest about 150 minutes of exercise every week in the ideal world. But if you're getting a little less, if you're getting a little bit more, that still might be right for you and your body, right? If you smoke, stop smoking. It's not good for, for your risk of cognitive impairment or stroke or, or, or other conditions, of course, as well, like cancer. Avoid caffeine within a few hours of bedtime. And of course, that's to help you fall asleep faster. Try to avoid also alcohol within a few hours of bedtime. The reason alcohol can be troublesome at night is because it can relax, it relaxes, it relaxes you, but it can also relax your muscles in your airway. And that can make you actually uh, be more likely to have sleep apnea because your airway would be more susceptible, susceptible to collapse. Finish eating a few hours before bedtime. The research shows that you metabolize food less efficiently at night. So if you eat a huge meal right before bed, you're not gonna metabolize it quite as well if you ate it a few hours earlier. Avoid looking at screens before bedtime. If you wanna, if you really need to look at screens before bedtime, you can use a blue light blocking glasses. You can buy them on Amazon or other online retailers and they're not that expensive. But the bottom line though, is that light itself, particularly blue light can activate your eyes and make it harder for you to fall asleep when you go to bed. So that's actually how uh, that's actually how the body can differentiate wake and sleep is just the light that's coming to your eyes. Um, have your work material TV computer in another room. And again, you want your bedroom only to be for sleep and for uh, time with your time with your with your partner. But otherwise, no work should be being done in the bedroom. And if you have worries on your mind, you can write them down leave them outside of your bedroom before you go to bed, okay? Sometimes I'll relax. If you're having a hard time falling asleep, 
using a relaxation technique before going to sleep can be beneficial. And your bedroom should be dark, quiet, slightly cool and comfortable for you. Okay, everyone has their own preferable sleeping environment. Bedroom, again, for only be for sleep or for time with your partner, perhaps an intimacy time. Regular bedtime, regular wake time. So set the same bedtime every day and the same waking up time every day is best for overall health. And some of us prefer to sleep a little bit later, sleep a little bit earlier. Um, that's a personal preference. Every one of us has a clock in our brains, what we call the circadian clock. And that will, um, and that, 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 sort of, that sort of specifies whether we have a preference to sleep earlier or a preference to sleep later. So myself, I like to go to bed late, but some of my students, they like to go to bed really early. <laughs> so uh, every one of us is different. Okay. There is no one time that's, that's like a generalizable right time to fall asleep. Every one of us is different in that regard. But it's just important that you're getting the right number of hours of sleep and good quality sleep. Sorry. Whoops. I'm sorry, guys. Um, yeah. Aim for about eight hours of sleep. Some people need nine. Some people need seven. But usually eight is an average. You should generally try avoid sleeping on your back because when you go on your back, your tongue could fall in your airway and you can collapse the airway. Okay. And so basically just when you're lying your back, just the, the force of gravity will tongue will pull your tongue back onto your airway and choke you at night. So what we tell patients and what we tell our, our people who come and see us in the clinic is put a tennis ball in the front pocket of a shirt. Something we call it the breast pocket of a shirt, put a tennis ball in the front pocket of the shirt or the breast pocket or that shirt backwards so that when you roll on your back by mistake at night, because in every one of us accidentally may roll in our sleep, right? But when you roll on your back accidentally at night, you get like a little nudge to remind you not to go on your back. If you can't sleep within 20 minutes, get out of bed, do something boring. You want your bed only to be associated with sleep and for pleasant things, but not for work, not for worries, not for any of these other things. So if you can't sleep within 20 minutes, get out of bed, do something boring, go do the laundry, you know, something that you don't find exciting and, uh, and then try to go back to bed. Okay. If you're not able to sleep within 20 minutes and get out of bed, but it's still, if you've tried all, these are simple tips, right? These are simple tips. But if you've tried all these tips and you still have trouble sleeping or you or your loved one has signs that they potentially may have sleep apnea, they're really sleepy during the day or they're snoring really, or they're snoring, or you have any other concerns about the sleep, then, uh, then certainly you should speak to your doctor and maybe get a referral to the sleep specialist. So that's that's it. I'm just, I'm just gonna do my conclusions. Then we take questions. I see the chat's filling up with some questions. Oh, actually, I actually haven't seen the chat yet, but we will we'll get to them. So I just wanna let everybody know that we have accurate, convenient and cost-effective ambulatory or home-based approaches to detect sleep disorders. Sleep apnea is linked with lots of bad stuff, increased risk of stroke, dementia, cognitive impairment, and even death, unfortunately. And evolving evidence supports the treatment of sleep apnea, what we sometimes abbreviate as OSA, in patients who have cognitive impairment and stroke. And there's a significant role in cognition, neurological recovery, mood, and quality of life. As I mentioned before, there aren't any randomized trials, which is the highest level of evidence we have for confirming a reduction in stroke events or mortality with CPAP, but these might be coming soon. And there are good strategies out there to get good quality sleep, okay? I just wanna thank all my collaborators, particularly David and Savvy, um, who, were, who were involved in some of the research that we talked about. No, no work, obviously I was involved in a lot of research, but no work is ever done in isolation. I just wanna thank everyone for their, um, for, their, for their interest and so on and so forth. And that's it. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, 